Uh, this is Stephen Davido. I serve as the project manager for Project Dispatch at the Society of Critical Care Medicine. I want to welcome you all to today's uh, webcast. Uh, first, I want to note that uh, Project Dispatch is supported by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, and uh, we thank them for their support in order to make these webcasts and other activities of Project Dispatch possible. I would first like to introduce our first presenter today, Linda. She is the Distinguished Professor of Symptom Management Research in the College of Nursing at The Ohio State University. You'll also hear from Erica Gonzalez, who's a nurse manager, multi-specialty progressive care unit at Baptist Health in Miami, Florida. And with that, I will turn it over to uh, Dr. Klein. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen. And I would like to thank the investigators and the organizers for the invitation to participate on this webinar. And I would like to say good afternoon to those of you in the Central and Eastern Time Zone, and good morning to those of you not in the Central or Eastern Time Zones. I'm very much looking forward to presenting my content uh, today. Uh, just a brief overview, I'm going to briefly address the properties of music that promote relaxation and anxiety reduction. I'm going to spend a little more time highlighting the results of a recent randomized clinical trial testing music for anxiety self-management and reducing sedative exposure in mechanically ventilated patients. And then I'm going to conclude with some, some suggestions for implementing music listening in the intensive care unit. We know that there are many, many patients admitted each year to the intensive care units in the United States, and most of those patients are admitted to ICUs because they require mechanical ventilatory support. Unfortunately, the need for prolonged ventilatory support is increasing, which has significant care processy implications that we all need to be aware of. But I always like to take the opportunity to remind ICU clinicians that ICUs are incredibly stressful for our patients and families. We are so comfortable in our day-to-day -day work settings that we forget many times how stressful this environment is for patients. And we know that patients experience many distressful and burdensome symptoms during their ICU stay, particularly those receiving mechanical ventilatory support, such as anxiety, pain, thirst, fatigue, and many other uh, symptoms. We also know that patients receiving mechanical ventilation experience profound physiological stress as well as psychological stress. We know that patients experience stress from critical illness or injury as well as physiologic breaths from the delivery of mechanical breaths. Of less attention many times is the psychological stress that mechanically ventilated patients experience, such as anxiety, which is simply defined as a heightened state of arousal. Patients typically report feeling very fearful, feeling miserable while they're in the ICU, and after they've been extubated, they many times convey their frustration with having been unable to speak, they cannot convey their feelings, their needs um, in an appropriate manner or easy manner to their care providers or their family members. My program of research focuses quite a bit on anxiety, which really is a very common bothersome symptom for mechanically ventilated patients. And most of the previous work uh, that I have done was taking a cross-sectional snapshot of anxiety ratings on one day in a sample of 200 mechanically ventilated patients. And what is most significant about this is that patients receiving prolonged mechanical ventilatory support actually report the highest anxiety ratings. And this definitely has significant implications, uh, again, for our care processes and how we manage this ongoing bothersome symptom for mechanically ventilated patients. So what is the big deal with sustained anxiety? Well, for unstable, critically ill patients, sustained anxiety 
can be very detrimental to our mechanically ventilated patients due to the increased sympathetic nervous system stimulation, which can lead to elevated cardiovascular responses, increased work of breathing, oxygen demand, uh, very unfavorable influences for mechanically ventilated patients. But we also need to keep in mind that sustained anxiety also causes psychological responses, most significantly the inability to relax or sleep. Uh, the way patients have described being so anxious to me is this general feeling of feeling revved up all the time. It's sort of like when one consumes way too much caffeine. It's this nervousness and this revved up feeling that um, really is very difficult to manage. So how we usually treat anxiety in the intensive care unit is to administer a variety of sedative medications. While sedative medications have their time and place, we are all very aware of the limitations of dosing with these medications, as well as the numerous adverse side effects in critically ill patients. So my clinical practice experience caring for mechanically ventilated patients in the MICU before I started my research career, I was always very puzzled and struck by the profound anxiety that mechanically ventilated patients experienced. I would administer sedative medications to them. Many times their anxiety would get worse, and I found that sedative medications um, had a limited effect in some patients. So this really led me down the path of searching for safe and scientifically sound adjunctive interventions or integrative interventions that could be used to help palliate some of this significant anxiety that mechanically ventilated patients experience. But we also needed to be aware of that these adjunctive interventions should not cause any adverse side effects in these patients. I, it, this, all these issues led me down the path of landing on music as a non-pharmacologic adjunctive intervention, which had been well documented in the coronary care unit patient population as being very effective to reduce anxiety. So I started my program of research to determine whether or not music intervention could reduce anxiety. And the study that I'm going to tell you all about today was built on many years of preliminary work to determine whether or not music can also reduce anxiety as well as reduce the amount of sedative exposure that patients experience over the course of mechanical ventilation. So just some very brief background on why music in this patient population. There are, music really is a complex auditory stimulation that is more than just something nice to listen to. Music perceived as familiar and soothing occupies areas of the brain. Music can interrupt the stress response by reducing catecholamines, and this in turn can facilitate relaxation. Music can also reduce anxiety in giving patients something very pleasant and pleasing to listen to, rather than focusing on stressful stimuli or noisy stimuli in the intensive care unit. Music itself can be a very powerful distractor. Uh, for those of you that work out in gym facilities, these settings play very loud, upbeat music, and they do that as a motivator. So music can also be used to distract one's thoughts, ideas, or any issues that might be bothersome at the time. And there is some evidence that shows that listening to music that is preferred and relaxing can reduce the amount of sedative medication during certain medical procedures such as colonoscopy or ambulatory surgery procedures. So the definition that we use uh, for relaxing music is music that has a beat of less than 80 beats per minute. It is very fluid and melodic. It is pleasing and familiar to patients. There is regular rhythm without sudden changes. 
and uh, we generally try to use music that is of soft tones and simple arrangements, but uh, what is relaxing to one person may not be relaxing to another person, so personal preference is very important, and I will touch on this a little bit later in our uh, presentation. So what I'm going to move to next are some highlights from our randomized trial that was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, uh, June of 2013. Uh, due to time limitations, I'm not going to go into all the details of this study. The uh, references provided there if you're interested in reviewing the entire manuscript. But this study that we designed, it was a three-group randomized clinical trial and patients uh, were remained in the study as long as they were mechanically ventilated up to 30 days. And it's important to note that this study concluded in 2011 and it was a four and a half year trial and at the time there were no formal sedation protocols in place. There were sedation orders for all the ICUs that participated um, and we had a number of ICUs. So this was, one could view this as more of a real world um, setting as far as sedation protocols go where there was wide variability among the ICUs. So patients were randomized to either the experimental condition of patient-directed music listening or one of two control conditions that we had. We had an active control condition of active noise canceling headphones as well as the usual or standard care for the intensive care unit. A little detail on what the patient-directed music intervention protocol consisted of. We based this experimental group on patient-controlled analgesia concepts. From the PCA literature, we know that patients can experience superior symptom management of pain when they can self-administer pain medication to manage this very distressful symptom. We also know that when patients use PCA, they typically have higher satisfaction ratings, and in some studies it has shown that they need less drug to manage the highly individual symptom of pain. How we proceeded with those who were randomized to the experimental patient-directed music intervention group they first had their music preferences assessed and they also received a daily visit by our board certified music therapist. We used an assessment tool that consists of a yes, no checkbox format and I will show you a slide of that tool. Uh, Dr. Annie Heiderscheidt was our study music therapist and she and I developed this music assessment tool specifically for use with mechanically ventilated patients. From the assessment data, Dr. Heiderscheidt assembled a preferred relaxing music collection of individualized music for each patient that was kept at the patient's bedside. And this protocol allowed choice, it allowed control, as well as self-management of anxiety. Patients were encouraged to listen to music whenever they wanted for as long as they wanted each day that they were in our study. In all, we had 12 intensive care units from five medical centers in the Minneapolis-St. Paul urban area. Patients were approached if they were receiving acute mechanical ventilatory support for a primary pulmonary component, such as respiratory failure or pneumonia. Patients needed to be alert and interacting appropriately with nursing staff and they also needed to provide their own informed consent and this was an IRB requirement from the University of Minnesota as well as a requirement of the intervention. And the study was deemed to be minimal risk from the Human Subjects Committee. Our primary measure was a 100 millimeter visual analog scale that we presented to patients in a vertical format, presented to patients like a thermometer, which was anchored by no anxiety at the bottom to the very top of the scale the most anxious ever felt. We used the Apache 3 for illness severity. We also examined length of time mechanically ventilated, length of ICU stay. We abstracted all medications that patients received over their time in the study, and then the music assessment tool was 
used with patients randomized to music. So in all, we enrolled 373 patients over about a four-year time period. A majority were female, uh, middle-aged, and a majority were white, which reflects the uh, makeup of the Minneapolis-St. Paul urban area. And uh, moderately critically ill with quite a range in um, Apache 3 scores. Most patients were admitted due to respiratory failure. Total ICU days were 17 with a wide range from 1 to 86. And total ventilator days, median was 10, incredibly wide range of 0 to 80. We used descriptive statistics and graphing. Um, as our analysis, and um, our primary analysis was mixed effects models, which evaluates change over time and can deal with uh, missing data. And we also considered a variety of covariates, and uh, we included a data from patients with two or more data points to model change over time. Study entry showed that patients were moderately anxious. However, there was quite a range from no anxiety to the most anxious ever. So this really highlights the highly variable and individual symptom that anxiety can be experienced by mechanically ventilated patients. Music patients listen to their preferred relaxing music for around 80 minutes per day. And headphones patients wore them for about 34 minutes per day. Overall, patients were in the study for around six days. Um, some patients were extubated, you know, the day after they were enrolled. And we did have some patients um, enrolled in our protocol for up to 30 days. This graph shows median anxiety over time. The pink bar is the patient-directed music intervention group. The green bar is headphones, and the black bar is usual care. So of note here is that the anxiety scores are trending downward if you put a line through these data. And they are much more um, tightly focused in a range, whereas the two control groups, the anxiety scores show quite a bit of variability. This graph shows mean sedation intensity by group with the visual analog scale scores posted here. And you can see that um, the sedation intensity goes down for the patient-directed music intervention group, um, more steady for the headphones, and usual care group. And this graph shows sedation frequency, or how often patients were giving, given sedation while in the um, study protocol. And you can see that the frequency with which sedation was administered to the music patients was much less frequent than the headphones group, with a downward trend also in the usual care group. So what do these findings mean? Uh, probably the most significant finding is that individual mechanically ventilated patients can control and manage their highly variable symptom of anxiety. Keep in mind that this intervention was modeled after patient-controlled analgesia concepts, where patients were empowered to use music whenever they felt like they needed some relaxation time or a break from the intensive care unit environment. Patient-directed music significantly reduced anxiety and sedative exposure over the course of mechanical ventilatory support. There was no difference in outcomes between the headphones and usual care group. We were able to reduce anxiety by 19.5 points, reduce sedation intensity by 36%, and sedation frequency by 38%. There are, however, uh, several challenges to implementing music intervention in the ICU. Please keep in mind that what I have just reported from our study was in a highly controlled, randomized clinical trial. How one should implement music listening for the day-to-day -day care processes in the ICU, I think, requires a little more thought and probably more research. Most prominently is the appropriate selection of patients, 
as well as the appropriate selection of symptoms that one is trying to manage with an adjunctive intervention. I need to caution you all that music should never be used instead of the usual plan of ICU medical care. There simply is just not enough evidence on safety and efficacy that music should be used in place of anything that occurs in the intensive care unit. Some thought needs to be given to um, equipment and what kind of music is going to be offered to patients. The volume needs to be checked for safety and we advocate the use of headphones or earbuds to block out some of the noise in the intensive care unit. Of extreme importance is that we all have musical memories and patients can have an adverse response to a specific piece of music, which is why assessment of music preferences is extremely important. We use the music assessment tool and I will show you that in just a minute here. There's the ongoing issue of live versus recorded music. We used recorded music in our study for ease of tracking what type of music patients listen to. And one also needs to think about um, are there music selections that are avail available on televisions in the ICU room? or are there commercially available packages. One needs to be very careful with copyright issues, particularly if you're uh, testing music in a research study. Again, we advocate headphones. Um, it can be a little unwieldy to try to use free field music, particularly if you have patients in most ICUs who are unresponsive or comatose. We don't know what they can or cannot hear in the immediate environment. Anxiety really is a key symptom that can be effectively reduced with appropriately selected music. Very important to remember that music listening is not for all patients. Not everyone enjoys listening to music and one size does not fit all. What's deemed to be a relaxing CD that one may purchase at Target or another type of store may not be deemed relaxing by a participant. This is page one of our music intervention assessment and implementation tool. And this tool is readily available on PubMed. Um, and it is published in Music Therapy Perspectives. But briefly, you can see here, the first question that the music therapist uses is, do you like to listen to music? As intuitive as that may sound, again, not everybody enjoys listening to music. And I will take questions at the end, and I will turn it over to my colleague, Erica Gonzalez. Before we have Erica begin, this is Stephen David. Uh -huh. uh, we did get one question on the chat that I thought I'd uh, share with you. Just oh, to, okay. Uh, see. Uh, and the person's asking, are there data for children? I'm particularly interested in what tempo is considered uh, soothing, considering children's higher resting heart rates. Um, mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, I do not know the the children literature uh, very well because all my work and experience is in adult ICU patients. But I would suggest that um, you refer to the work of Jane Standley, S-T-A-N-D-L-E-Y. She has done quite a bit of work with uh, children and music therapy. Okay. Well, thank you. We'll now uh, hear from Erica Gonzalez at Baptist Health from uh, in Miami, Florida. I'll turn it over to Erica. Hi all. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. It has uh, been you know, a passion of mine to talk about pet and music therapy. I would like to thank the organizers but also the attendees for taking interest in such a you know uh, interesting subject to you know, in caring for the critically ill. And also thank you Linda. What an enlightening uh, presentation you just gave it to us. It's really good to, you know, see, you know, research meeting, you know, alternative uh, uh, strategies to take care of the critical new patients. Before I started, I just wanted to um, say that um, give a little bit of demographics on on 
my hospital. Uh, we are a 32-bed ICU uh, multi-specialty, which includes cardiac, neuro, and medical surgical. Um, and we base our delivery of care in the principles of patient and family centered care, which is um, four principles about respect and dignity, participation, sharing information, and collaboration. And because we, you know, embrace those principles in our daily practice, it was interesting to look at other alternative strategies to take care of the critically ill, knowing that, um, you know, the medical care, the plan uh, will not be um, in helping the patients recover or at least, you know, diminish anxiety as um, eloquently Linda put it in her research. Um, so we thought about pet therapy because, you know, uh, family, you know, in our ICU can be whoever or whatever the patient chooses. And most of the times the patients that have been in our critical care for a longer period of time, they, you know, uh, the family talks about, uh, you know, how they miss their pet and how, you know, seeing their pet would make them feel better. And taking into consideration that we are about collaborating with the patients and the families to deliver the best high quality care that we can, we thought about, you know, why can't we include the pet in, in, in a pet therapy format to help these patients, you know, survive or at least provide a dignifying death while they are in the ICU. Uh, originally, we thought about doing service pets, uh, service dogs primarily, but we thought that this would not be a tailoring kind of care. And as Linda put it in her presentation, that one size does not fit all, we thought about and used that as a background, so we said, how about using the patient's own pet? And uh, together with that, you know, it kind of, uh, you know, came along, we also used musical, musical therapy. Not in the same format as Linda was describing, but we use more of a you know, uh, less affair, if I can call, uh, where we do have, uh, you know, beds equipped with some music that we can choose from different kinds of music. And also we have channels in the room that we use as, uh, um, for the patient to utilize. But we also thought that the patient might be interested in, in their own kind of music. And I will tell a little bit about how that whole concept started. And um, one of our nurses, you know, decided to do a, a research not as profound as Linda presented, but it was more of a local research. She was doing her master's and she said, why don't we kind of uh, put, you know, the data that we have into some kind of research and see if this might work. And that's how it always started. And uh, she started, you know, crafting some of the idea of a pet therapy, what it would be uh, beneficial for the patient. Some of the data that Linda presented was evident in the literature, how that decreases anxiety, how it, it decreases the amount of uh, sedation that we might use, and how it brings joy to the patient overall, and that helps, you know, the patient to um, recover. So it also brings a sense of uh, worth, and the patients nowadays and the families like to take control of that staying in ICU. It's not so much about the doctors and the healthcare providers, including nurses and social workers and therapists, but it's about the patient being, you know, empowered to uh, work with us to uh, provide the best care that we can. So these findings that she did, they were strong validated by research literature, and we started this project, you know, how pet therapy can improve the recovery of patients in the ICU setting. We craft a policy uh, because our hospital is, you know, heavily guided on policies just to make sure that we're doing the same thing, you know, uh, consistently, and we craft this policy which involves making sure that the pet that is visiting the patient is, you know, um, adequate for that visit, meaning that it's not going to cause any harm to the environment, so they need to be vaccinated, they need to be bathed 24 hours prior to the visit, and they need to showcase proof of vaccines and physical exam. That, you know, in the beginning, it was scary because people thought that might take a lot of time to expedite those requirements, but the reality is most of the people that own pets, and we all love our pets, I'm a pet lover myself, we pretty much have those requirements, you know, line up any day. So it was not, uh, you know, such a trouble for the patients and the families to um, provide those requirements in a timely manner. And um, we established 30 minutes time for the 
for the visit. But the reality is that we all fell in love with the visit. You know, the pets would enchant our ICU, and it would brought so much joy that sometimes we would leave it, uh, you know, for longer, depending on how the 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 visit was perceived by the patient. And uh, we follow standard precautions, of course, that we work with the infection control department to make sure that that visit was safe, was, um, you know, the patients w will be safe, the patients around, you know, that, I, uh, that patient that was receiving the PET, that it was no hazard to the environment, and therefore we, we work with them. And we prepare the patients and the family and the environment for the visit, which would not take that much time. It was just a matter of informing the patient, make sure that we had a time frame for when um, that would happen. And it was, you know, kind of a control environment, so the visit would go as, as smooth as possible. Uh, the outcomes, I have some pictures here. Uh, I like to highlight the one with the Labrador to the bottom right. That was our first one. And I have to tell you this, the first time that we, the, the family says, it's a Labrador, and I said, oh boy, it's a big dog. We thought about him jumping around, disconnecting the ventilator, you know, moving probes. And uh, we just took a leap of faith. We prepared the settings. We said, let's do it. And this was in the morning after the multidisciplinary uh, rounds. And let me tell you this. This Labrador brought so much joy to that patient that, you know, nothing else, no medicine could do it. And the family was delighted. You know, the staff was so happy to be part of something so groundbreaking, something so outside of the box. But um, that the Labrador, and he was so well behaved, I said, I wish that dog was mine. He was such a good dog, but it just brought, uh, you know, a lot of joy to the environment. It was really a very good first time doing this. So after that, it just became like, you know, uh, our daily activities kind of thing. We had tons of uh, moments that we capture with the family really happy. Sometimes the patient will not uh, be aware. As uh, Linda said, sometimes they were under ventilatory support. But the fact that the family was collaborating with us to provide that kind of a strategy to take care of the patient, it just brought a sense of a purpose to what we were doing, that it goes beyond just medical care, nursing care, and all the other, you know, um, standard, you know, routine of care that we do in the hospital. So the, the results is that the hospital adopted this pet therapy now is uh, fully thorough in our hospital. And, uh, you know, of course that ICU continues to be the one that explores this, this, uh, this kind of therapy the most. We do believe in the value that adds to the care, but I'm Currently, the nurse manager of a progress care unit, so some of the patients that come from ICU go to my unit, and I'm very happy to say that I continue that therapy in my unit uh, because we do have some chronic patients. They are, uh, you know, um, there for a long time and transfer from the ICU, knowing that that kind of therapy helps them in ICU, so they continue in my unit. In my unit. Um, and then it brings me to music therapy. So it was such a successful initiative that we said, why not think about music? So just like that therapy, music has positive effects on patients. You know, it has such a positive effect on people. Of course, not everybody likes music, but most of the people feel very positive about it. You know, uh, as once said by Steve Jobs, you know, with the iPod idea, you connect people, you know, with music. And we thought that why not connect, you know, music to the patients while they are in the ICU. So it relaxes, it decreases anxiety, and of course, you know, all the, you know, uh, physiological and psychological effects that those uh, symptoms have on the patients, you know, the recovery or not. And we said, why not try? So. Uh, the patient chooses their music and families bring or use the music bed feature. We do, as I said before, we do have a, our beds are programmed to deliver some music so you can choose from classical, rock and roll, jazz and blues, you have all kinds of music. But the story that has inspired us is a very pretty story. We have this patient and, um, you know, she was in ICU for quite, I would say like three or four days. She was on continuous BiPAP, and she refused to be intubated. Uh, but the family, a large family, very attached to the patient, 
um, didn't want to let her go. But she clearly wanted to, you know, make her own decision. So we had a, you know, a meeting with the family, and uh, we they said, well, at this point, we are about to make sure that she, we respect her choice. And uh, one thing that they mentioned to us is that she loves music. You know, she loves music, and, and the sounds of the bypass machine and all the sounds in ICU is driving her crazy. So uh, they came to us and they said, can we bring some kind of music to the ICU? And I said, oh boy. But uh, I said, why not? Because I knew that the outcome for this lady was, you know, uh, certainly not survive the ICU, but at least we want to preserve her dignity, her, you know, respect her wishes and make sure that, you know, she didn't, she didn't have that noise in the background as, you know, her final moments. So they asked us if they could bring a mariachi band, which uh, not exactly soothing in a sense of, you know, being soft and, and low, but very loud and very, you know, bold. Um, and, but that's what, what, what she liked. And we said we have to preserve her rights to choose. So we coordinated to have the mariachi, mariachi band coming in at, um, at uh, you know, at night. And, uh, you know, we prepare the other uh, people in ICU, we prepare the other, you know, patients and families, we talk about uh, the, the noise, we provided them with some earbuds just in case the, no the noise was too much. But let me tell you, it brought such a special moment to us. The family was elated that they provided her the mariachi moment. The patient was happy and we were, you know, in such a peace because we have respected her wishes and the other patients all wanted to bring, you know, all kinds of mariachis and all kinds of music. So I said we opened a Pandora box in a very good way. So after that experience that we owe deeply to that patient, we decided to incorporate music to our daily life. It's not something strict, it's very organic. Sometimes they bring their own music. We have a patient that loved uh, uh, Italian music and we asked the family to bring the Italian music. We did put it in her, in her ears. With of a relaxation that we don't see when everything is just the noise of the equipment and the machines and the alarms that we see. So um, with that said, it's something that we continue to pursue to make it better. Uh, but, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's one of the things that we really are proud, you know, in ICU is to use those kind of therapies to help, you know, uh, deliver the care that we, the patients so deserved. We'll uh, go ahead and start taking some questions. Thank you very much uh, both to uh, Linda and Erica. Uh, we'll go ahead and start with a question for Erica first. We've got quite a number of questions that have come in on the chat, so uh, bear with me here. Uh, the first question is, uh, are the pets limited to just cats and dogs? Erica? Erica, are you there? Okay. While we try to reconnect with Erica, let me uh, find a question for for Linda. Just I'm sorry. Uh, I'm back. There she is. <laughs> sorry, I lost you guys for a second. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, all right. Our, our first question. Erica was uh, to you, and that was, uh, are the pets limited to just cats and dogs? No, actually, we have we had birds. The only thing that we have not had is snakes, but there was an attempt for a snake. <laughs> <laughs> and that one, I was a little bit scared because I don't like snakes. But I said, well, you know, we have to to go for it. But it did not happen. But all kinds of of pets. Okay, great. Uh, we're going to jump around a little bit, uh, so uh, bear with me. Uh, the uh, 
next question is, what do you think of the use of music in those mechanical ventilated patients who cannot use the MAT? And I believe that would be for Linda. Uh-huh. Oh, okay. You know, it depends on the purpose, I would say, uh, because our study was a randomized trial. We had to have the same approach for all our patients, but I think uh, one does not need to use as extensive of an assessment tool as the MAT that we used in our research study. But I, I personally and my music therapist colleague feel very strongly about having some idea what patients like. As Erica so eloquently presented with the work of her colleagues at her hospital, you know, what one person might like a string quartet and her patient wanted a mariachi band. And I think that shows the uh, wide variety of music preferences that people have. And if you don't ask, you're not going to know what they like. Um, but one way that we've also helped uh, patients, because not everybody's going to really be able to may not be able to tell you right off the bat what they like or don't like. So many times we would ask family members to bring in either a playlist or some of their music that they might have at home, and the music therapist found that very helpful for our study. So I, we, are, we are proponents of assessment. A related question, I believe, and that is, as your six-question shortened version of of the STAI been published for broad use. Is this what is recommended to use in the ICU IMC population versus the STAI? Oh, okay. Um, we found that we had less missing data with the visual analog scale because critically ill patients uh, and their inability maybe sometimes in low energy levels found it really quite easy to respond to how anxious they are feeling. This short version of the state anxiety inventory, uh, we have published the six items from the Spielberger state anxiety inventory. And if someone is interested in using the Spielberger state anxiety inventory, you first have to purchase the use of it from the test publisher. And then one could easily go and shorten it down to the six questions that we came up with for our mechanically ventilated research participants. All right. Our next question is, uh, do pets have to go through a training and or pet therapy training program in order to participate? No, not at all. Uh, most of the times that we had one time that we had two pets, actually, there were two New York Shires, and they were small. They were a little bit loud, but, you know, we, kind, we just restricted the time that they were there. It was like 30 minutes, but, uh, you know, that was the only time that the behavior was kind of a little bit off, but most of the times the, pa the, the pets were very well behaved. Uh, so n not exactly, not at all. Okay. Um. Another question uh, for you, Erica, and that would be, uh, would pet therapy be best for chronically hospitalized patients? Uh, yes, actually, because we extended the, the policy to other floors, other floors uh, decided to use only for chronic patients. Uh, there is a line in the policy, I believe it says, um, you know, they have to be there at least five or six days. And, you know, usually that's how they do it on other floors. In the critical care, in our critical care, we usually don't have any restrictions because, you know, those are, the, you know, the critically ill patients. But on the other floors, definitely they put, uh, you know, a time uh, as far as when the, the patient is allowed to have that visit, which is about five to six days after hospitalization. And usually are the chronic patients. This question is for, well, let me just jump, bear with me. Uh, this is for Linda. Was there a music therapist involved in, in your facility? If not, care should be taken not to describe it as music therapy, it says. I'm sorry, there's a comment. Uh, 
uh, that that is my point exactly. Uh huh. I totally agree. That's why I say music intervention or music listening. And uh, typically, music therapists are a rarity in hospitalized settings. Uh, the person of, uh, further uh, stated that uh, many healthcare professionals incorporate music into their practice, but the term music therapy should indicate that a board certified music therapist is I directly agree. involved. I agree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, fair enough. Uh, this question is pretty uh, straightforward for Erica. Were there? I think you've already answered it, but I'll ask it anyway. And that is, are there any breed restrictions in terms of the types of pets that uh, dogs and cats that you allow to come into your uh, unit? Not at all. Not at all. We as a, we have, uh, you know, sometimes people are concerned about uh, pets that shed a lot, but uh, so far we have not limited any pets, and if they did shed, we didn't see it that much. So, no. I believe this is for uh, Linda. You, I think you touched on it in your presentation, but uh, do you believe uh, therapy could still be of benefit and reduce the amount of sedation required? Um, yes, I do. I'm, I'm not exactly sure what that question is. Okay. All, yeah. Yeah, it's not. I mean, there's definitely room for improvement with any research study, but <laughs> no, I I totally agree. As long as it's you know a, done appropriately, and that symptoms are appropriately managed, which in many cases in the intensive care unit is a combination of pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic interventions. The next question is also for you, Linda, and that is, are there specific uh, specifications you have for the type of headphones, wireless, to use in conjunction with computer workstation in each of the patient rooms? Okay, good question. Um, we used, again, because this was for a research study, we used uh, pretty, pretty inexpensive noise canceling headphones because we needed to mimic the control condition of noise canceling headphones only. So we used the same headphones for the experimental music group as well as the headphones group. And we needed to time and date stamp each time the headphones were on and off to documented music listening and headphone wearing. So we had um, our biomedical engineer place a switch in the bracket of the headphone that activated a data logger. So our headphones actually had a, had a cord because of the way the equipment needed to be set up for our research purposes. If that answer, hopefully that answers the question. Okay. Our next question is uh, related and uh, that is, what decibel did you use with your earbud music? Uh, we used only headphones, and uh, we had our protocol was that the research nurse who set the patient up with the music listening equipment would test the volume and then place a mark on the player where the patient preferred the volume, and then that was something that was assessed on a regular basis. So we did not measure the decibel level per se, but we know that our noise canceling headphones could reduce uh, noise in the environment by 15 decibels. Um, so many questions. We have <laughs> lots coming in. Um, so here, uh, this one is for Erica. Can patients who are on contact isolation have pet visits in their room? 
We never had anybody on, on contact isolation, uh, but uh, there was a, a, one of the, the aspects that we discussed is if we would allow, usually what we do is if the patient wants to, we can, you know, just prepare the visit for after. Like if it is C. diff, let's say, uh, we, we do run the C. diff test and see if the patient, you know, is able to receive that patient. We put the, the, the visitation on hold. Uh, we never had one specifically, but that is a, a subject that came about uh, if we would allow it. Uh, infection control uh, advises not to but um, not because there was any contraindications or anything like that, but, you know, just to make sure that we are, we could not, go, we could go on the, 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 the path, I believe, but it was just kind of, <laughs> right, that was one of the things, we came down the path and, you know, but there was other, other things that we, we didn't think that was quite right, so we put the visitation on hold and the patient was eventually able to get the visit, but, uh, yeah, maybe it's an aspect that we can, we have to work on and maybe, you know, design some gowns for the, the but it has not happened yet. Okay. Our next question uh, is for Erica. The person's asking, who supervises the visits when the dogs come in and are they on a leash? Okay. Usually what we do, we, we prepare the environment, uh, as we contact infection control, we let them know that we're going to have that visit, we try to do it in times there are no, you know, a lot of visitors coming in, a lot of family, so, uh, but usually the nurse is, you know, uh, kind of briefed on the visit and understands, reads the policy, understands what you're supposed to do, uh, and the family uh, knows that the nurse, you know, is going to be there for the time being. But most of the times, as I said, the, the visits that we had, everybody was kind of uh, involved because everybody wanted to participate. But usually the nurse is the one that is handling, you know, the, the, the protocol of the visit and making sure that the family knows the time frame and, and observes and supervises the patient as well. Great. Our next question is for Linda. Is there evidence that music therapy improves anxiety related to weaning from mechanical ventilation? Has your team examined whether patients choose to listen to music during weaning trials? Mm -hmm. um, actually, there has been extremely limited amount of work in that area. Um, but I have one of my PhD advisees is uh, conducting that project for her dissertation research. So stay tuned. Uh, another person is asking, and this is for Linda, what did you use to measure patient satisfaction with the music therapy in general? Uh, we did not specifically for our study, uh, but we did track patient comments and family comments. And I really can't give you any more detail because we have a manuscript under review in regards to those comments. Can I just add, you know, of sure. course that I don't have oh, the sure. data that, that, that uh, uh, Linda is talking about, but I can say that overall, from, you know, very subjectively speaking, the families are just so happy. It, they feel part of it. They feel included. There is a sense of inclusiveness that it, it generates a lot of uh, satisfaction from all ends, from the staff, from the patients, from the family. Sometimes we cannot, you know, kind of gauge that from the patients because they are you know, comatose or so forth, and now in, in, in the full state of mind, but we can see that there is a strong sense of collaboration, which is a satisfaction for all ends. So I can mm -hmm. only speak about what we yeah. observe, and that's usually the feeling that we gather. Right. That's an excellent point, Erica, and I think what is so powerful about these integrative therapies is that it really humanizes a very high-tech, depersonalizing environment. Absolutely, absolutely. We received a number of questions uh, related to uh, screening the animals uh, for various um, diseases and illnesses before being allowed in uh, to visit with the patient and also the potential impact on other patients in the unit or in the hospital. Um, so I, there were a number that were specific in terms of related to screen, worry about uh, C. diff or MRSA or um, salmonella. Uh, so I guess the question is um, what kind of screening uh, was done for these 
these we, animals. We only requested that they would show proof of vaccination in a visit to their vet. Um, and they had to submit that prior to the visit. Um, we usually submit that to the infection control department. They review it and they okay the visit. Uh, but pretty much that's it, just a vaccination and a recent visit to the vet. And bathing, right? Yes, yes, definitely. <laughs> they, they have to, thank you, Linda. Yes, definitely <laughs> they have to bathe prior to coming in. And uh, we also ask for proof of that as well. Related question in terms of like for dogs, um, and I think you answered it probably in your presentation, uh, but people are asking, or one person asked about just trying to assess what the dog's behavior would be when uh, they would be there in the unit. Did you try no. to do anything in advance? Yeah, well, if there was one time that we had a dog, a chihuahua, that needed to be, needed to be in the cage all the time, but... Uh, <laughs> Yes, we, they tried to put the, the, you know, closer to the patient in the bed, and, but the chihuahua was just scared and he was whimpering and making all these sounds. Uh, it was nice to see that the patient had a good reaction to it, but uh, the family decided to put him back on the cage, so the patient was just happy to know that he was there. As I said, the behavior was not well, be nothing like the lever, though, that I spoke about in the beginning. He was such a great dog, and uh, it, it it, but, you know, we kind of navigate through the circumstances and, and, and each dog, you know, reacts differently to the environment. This particular dog needed to be caged and the family apparently knew of already and kind of brought the cage in. So we now, based on these testimonies and the, the, the examples that we had, we kind of tell the family, listen, if your dog is, you know, afraid of this and the noises and the, 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 you know, kind of a strange environment, just make sure that you bring a cage and, you know, lately that's what they've been doing. Okay. Well, I, I hate to say that we're at the top of the hour. Actually, we've just gone past and we have lots of questions still on the table, but we're going to have to end the call today uh, here. I want to thank uh, Linda and uh, Erica for their time and their very interesting, thought-provoking uh, presentations. We'll see if we can maybe get some uh, answers to some of these questions offline and, and get them out to folks, and we can maybe post them on the Project Dispatch website. I'll remind our listeners today that the uh, recording of the webcast as well as the slides will be posted on the Project Dispatch website within the next 10 business days. And with that, um, I'll bring our uh, webcast to a close. Please uh, look for uh, other announcements about future Project Dispatch webcasts. We're going to be having one a month uh, for about the next year. So thank you uh, to Linda and Erica, and thank you all for listening.